But, but to inter all right, good. To, inter to introduce Mayor uh, Castro is my dearest friend, the woman who speaks for me in the House of Representatives, a woman of tremendous courage, one of the great fighters, not only for civil rights, but for peace, a voice in the wilderness at the beginning of the Iraq mess, and she's never stopped fighting for peace and to keep America from sending its troops overseas into a lot of kind of ridiculous fights and wanting to concentrate our money on education and housing and health care. I give you the great member of Congress, Barbara Lee. guys in the back, you can't hear it all. A lot of empty seats up in front. I'm not a guy from the, you know, neighborhood. I can't do anything. Unless you want to turn the mic up louder. Is Alec here, the electrician? I'm not kidding. There's a lot of empty seats for people. If you can't, if you can't hear me talking through a mic, then there's a real damn acoustical problem here. Okay, we'll do the best we can. All right. <laughs> Give our chair a round of applause. Isn't he doing a fabulous job? And I just have to thank our chairman for that very kind introduction. I served, I said earlier, in the California Assembly and Senate with him. And I tell you, there is nobody, there is nobody who cares about this Democratic Party and who has led this Democratic Party in the most enlightened way because we are the most enlightened and progressive state in the entire state of the United States of America. So give Congress, Congressman, Senator, Assemblyman, my friend John Burton, our chair, a round of applause. Thank you, John. Thank you. And also, I just have to say, uh, I don't think Nancy's here right now, but she was here earlier, and I, I am so proud to serve with leader, soon to be speaker again, Nancy Pelosi, who's going to lead us to victory, to victory in November. She is working day and night, day and night, to make sure that we elect Democrats to the House of Representatives so that we can forge ahead with our agenda of change, which reflects California's values as Democrats. So tell Nancy Pelosi, give her some love, make sure we support her efforts as she continues to fight for us in D.C. and in these elections to take back the House. Let me take a minute to thank all of my fellow members of Congress, all of our elected officials from all across the state, and our party members and supporters, and to all of the speakers who we have heard from already. You all, you know, our grassroots Democrats in California, you're truly putting California values into action and making our great state really a model for the rest of the nation on so many issues. Actually, if you heard Keith at lunch, he talked about how far ahead we are on each and every issue here in California. So goes California, though, so goes the rest of the country. So I have a lot of hope for our country. And you know, you're the heart and soul of the Democratic Party the heart and soul. And also, I have to take a moment and just say to my dedicated, progressive Alameda County constituents, where are you? You guys continue to lead. It's so good to see you. Your vision and your activism and your intellect really drives our party in so many ways. So thank you for your support. Now this year, this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act and the War on Poverty. Let, which has worked, mind you, even though Paul Ryan may say it didn't work, believe you me, it has worked. We've come a long way, have a long way to go, but the war on poverty has worked. And I tell you, this was led, this was led by a great president, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, from my home state of Texas, my home state of Texas. 
And tonight, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce really the manifestation of the dreams of Lyndon Baines Johnson, who is a, Mayor Castro, he is an amazing man who embodies our democratic values, but he also reflects all of the vision and dreams and the hard work of what 50 years with all of, many of you who are of that age, all of your activism has produced. Mayor Castro is inspiring Democrats and people all over this nation by putting our values, your values, to work each and every day as mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Now, Mayor Julian Castro has brought real and good pain, mind you, good pain, 21st century jobs to San Antonio. He has revitalized the city's urban core, and he initiated a decade of downtown, a decade, mind you, of downtown to encourage inner city investment. Now, California and Texas, we share a lot, but we share the border with Mexico, and we are a unified economic region which shares commerce, we share ideas, we share education, and we share people, and he gets that. Mayor Castro has brought many education initiatives, including bringing quality, full-day pre-kindergarten, pre, mind you, pre-kindergarten to over 22,000, 22,000 four-year-olds. Can you imagine 22,000 four-year-olds? 22,000. Also, because of his leadership, he opened what he calls the Cafe College, which is a one-stop center offering quality guidance on college admissions. Now in San Antonio, young people who otherwise would not have access nor an opportunity to go to college, they now have that because of Mayor Castro. Because of Mayor Castro. Now, Mayor Castro was the youngest elected city councilman in San Antonio's history at age 26. 26. Now he is, what, 38 years old? And so he's the youngest mayor of a top 50 American city. He is a shining example of a new generation of leaders, a new generation who was named at the World Economic Forum list of global leaders. He serves on the board of the National League of Cities and a host of other leadership roles. He also earned, he knows California very well. He earned his undergraduate degree at Stanford, at Stanford, and his law degree from Harvard, from Harvard. Now, I have to tell you, Mayor Castro is married to a beautiful woman. His wife, Erica, is an elementary school teacher, and he's the, okay, we got some teachers in the house. We got some teachers. And he is the proud father of Karina, who I think turns five years old very soon. So he's a family man. I serve with his twin brother, Joaquin Castro, in Congress, who has hit the ground running and making his mark in a very powerful way already. Now finally, let me just remind you of the Democratic Convention very recently that was held. You may remember Mayor Castro's speech. He gave the keynote speech. It was an amazing speech. It was an amazing speech. You remember that. He told his family story about his mother and her challenges. And I'm dying to meet his mother because her challenges really demonstrate the si se puede attitude and spirit. And he talked about that at the convention. And let me remind you, and I just have to sh say this, Mayor Castro, you know, I was in Boston, and our first African-American president, the great Barack Obama, he gave the keynote speech at the Democratic Convention in 2004. And I knew then, like I know now, that with Mayor Castro's brilliance and his leadership and his spirit, that he too, is the manifestation of Dr. King's dream 
but he's also destined to do great things, great things on the national stage. And so with that, let's give Mayor Julian Castro a resounding California Democratic Party welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. First of all, uh, let me say a huge thank you to you, Congressman Lee, Congresswoman Lee, for your fantastic leadership, not just of the Democratic Party here in California, but as a role model to so many folks and carrying the progressive cause throughout the United States of America. Thank you so much for your leadership. Well, I also, uh, Congresswoman, want to give you uh, greetings from my brother, Joaquin, your colleague. As you probably know, my brother uh, habitually goes around telling people that the way to tell us apart is that I am a, mi a minute uglier than he is. <laughs> the real difference is that I'm a minute older. And uh, this evening, He's in Washington, D.C. at the gridiron over there listening to Ted Cruz. So I'm a minute happier tonight also. <laughs> of course, our great congresswoman hails from Alameda County, from Oakland. I know we have some folks from Oakland here. I bet we also have some folks from San Diego. How about anybody from the Central Valley? How about San Francisco? All right, how about uh, LA? All right. Chairman Burton, congratulations to you on your stellar leadership of the party. It is so nice to be with a Democratic Party that is well organized, that has been successful. You took this party and brought it out of debt and into success swept the California state races and have set yourself up very well and the party for 2014 when I know that y'all will sweep again. Thank you for all your leadership. Well, we gather at a time when the world is changing faster than it ever has in human history. It's a time of great technological progress and also of geopolitical upheaval. It's a time that demands vision and leadership. It's a time when the nerds at Stanford regularly crush the cow bears in the big game. What in the world is going on? <laughs> in all seriousness, though, it is a time when more than ever, the values that have made America great of freedom, democracy, and opportunity are needed more than ever in our nation and throughout the world. My brother Joaquin and I are convinced that the United States has distinguished itself over the generations because it has always stood for liberty. The events of these past two weeks in the Ukraine remind us that that is not the case all over the world. And little by little, over the generations, the United States has sought a more perfect union, and the people have extended freedom to more and more individuals. It used to be that all men were created equal, and we are coming upon a time when all of us will be treated equally, gay or straight. Black, white, brown, yellow. And that includes the final frontier of civil rights. As Congresswoman Lee mentioned, this year we celebrate 50 years of the Civil Rights Act, when Lyndon B. Johnson, building on the work of John F. Kennedy and the great Martin Luther King Jr., passed this landmark act to ensure that no matter where you come from or the color of your skin, that you could be free in this country and exercise your rights and truly pursue happiness. And today we find ourselves 
in states like Texas with a similar challenge to ensure that our brothers and sisters who are gay and lesbian have the ability to marry the people that they love. And more than that, that they are free from discrimination in the workplace and in the public square. I'm very proud that just a few months ago, San Antonio, the seventh largest city in the United States, added its name to the list of cities that have passed a comprehensive non-discrimination ordinance to ensure that everyone is treated equally. Our country has also distinguished itself by embracing democracy, by ensuring that we are a government by, for, and of the people with the opportunity to be represented by the people that we choose, the folks who represent our vision and our values. Next year, we'll celebrate 50 years of the Voting Rights Act. And it has been a process of pain and of triumph and of progress, but today one that risks being turned back by folks on the other side of the aisle, passing voter ID and purging voter rolls and doing every single thing that they can to slow the demographic wave of change, we must beat back those efforts and ensure that democracy is expanded and not lessened in the United States in the years to come. And without question, this nation has become great because it has expanded opportunity. At the convention almost two years ago, I had the opportunity to tell the story of how I reached that platform. I grew up mostly with my mother and my grandmother. And my, my grandmother had come from Mexico when she was six years old, along with her four-year-old sister as an orphan in 1922. And my grandmother ended up dropping out in the fourth grade. And because of that, she worked her life as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter. But she raised my mother as a single parent and saw my mother become the first in her family to graduate from college. And I grew up with a mother who was very unlike my grandmother in one way. She was politically involved. When she was 23, she ran for city council in San Antonio. And at that time, they had no single member districts. And she didn't get elected. But I grew up getting dragged to rallies and speeches and meetings. And if you had asked me when I was 15 years old if I ever thought that I would go into politics, I would have said no. Who likes to get dragged to a three-hour organizational meeting at the public library when the adults are talking about who knows what? And my attitude about politics didn't change until I came here to California. When I came to Stanford, it was the first time that I ever had the opportunity to see the community that I had grown up in through a different eye, to see that there in the Bay Area was a community that had higher education levels and higher income levels and was more innovative than the city that I had come from. And my interest in public policy developed from the idea of how I could create that in its own way in Texas. And more than anything else, out of a feeling that I had been blessed with great opportunity myself and a desire to do something so that others in my community might also have those opportunities in the future. And what I see around the nation today are so many folks earnestly working hard 40, 50, 60 hours a week and yet not getting ahead. I see a lot of folks who have done everything that they should, pursued the American dream like we're taught to, and yet not achieving it. 
We have in front of us the opportunity in this year, 2014, and in the years to come, very concrete ways to change that. One of the things that we should do and that I know Congresswoman Lee has pushed for is to raise the minimum wage so that millions of folks can finally earn more and help get them up into the middle class. 20 years ago, I remember sitting in a dorm at Stanford University and watching these ads come on the television from Pete Wilson. And the ads had this grainy black and white footage of folks at the border coming to America for a better life. But the ad said, they keep coming in a menacing voice. 20 years ago, Governor Wilson chose to demonize undocumented immigrants for short-term political gain. And 20 years later, we can see where that got him in California. And now the National Republican Party faces a choice. In places like Texas and Arizona and Alabama, we hear echoes of Pete Wilson. And in our Congress, we see a recalcitrance, a stubbornness to recognize that it is past time that instead of scapegoating undocumented immigrants, we bring them into the fold. The Republican Party faces a very clear choice. They can either pass comprehensive immigration reform or Latinos and Asian Americans will pass on them in the future. But we know that the way to ensure that folks get ahead in the long run is to make sure that they get a great education. My wife is a teacher. I know the great work that our teachers do each and every day. We face for the first time in the United States a global competition for investment. We face rising nations around the world that are producing the talent and the brain power to manipulate the technologies that will define quality of life and economic opportunity in the future. We are in a time when brain power is the new currency of success in this 21st century global economy. Communities and nations that create it will thrive and those that don't will fall behind. And so it's not just about individual opportunity, it is a national economic imperative that in the halls of Congress and in the halls of each state legislature and in city halls across the United States, we get serious about funding education and ensuring success. In San Antonio, we understand that in order to be pro-business, you have to be pro-education. And in November of 2012, we got San Antonio voters to do something that they had never done before. They decided to increase the sales tax by an eighth of a cent to significantly expand high quality full day pre-K for four year olds in our city so that we have the best educated, most well prepared, most ready young kids in all of the state of Texas who are ready for the future. And the truth is that in the years to come, our success as a nation will be defined by how well your children and your grandchildren sitting in those classroom seats do. I firmly believe that the American dream is not a sprint or a marathon, but it is a relay. One generation builds on the next to reach the finish line. And all of us, you and I, stand on the shoulders of generations of Americans that made beds and made sacrifices, that stood up and sat in, that picked crops and picketed in lines, that 
fought in wars and fought discrimination. People who gave us the freedom, the democracy, and the opportunity that we enjoy today. And I'm convinced that if we continue as a democratic party to expand these ideals, to cherish these values and put them into action, there is nothing that can stop the Democratic Party in the United States of America, here in California and otherwise. And so, from this mayor in Texas, I came here tonight to congratulate you on all of the success that you have had in this golden state. I have to tell you that I'm quite jealous. In Texas, we have zero Democrats who were elected to statewide office, but I know that that'll change. I know that with hard work, the phone banking, the block walking, the emailing, the Facebooking, the tweeting, that here in California, y'all will sweep the elections in November. And I look forward to 2016 and that first Tuesday night in November and watching as the election returns come in on ABC and CBS and CNN and MSNBC, and I look forward to the moment when Britt Hume turns to Brett Baer and says, Brett, we have the 55 electoral votes of the great state of California for the Democratic nominee and the next President of the United States. Go California, make it happen. Thank you.